<laughs> okay, we're letting all of it. We have 15 people in the waiting room. Okay. Welcome everybody. Slowly letting people in. Hello and welcome to um, our golf lecture for the evening. I just want to make sure that uh, the sound is working. So if I could get a high five or thumbs up, um, that would be fantastic to make sure that everyone can hear us. Thank you so much. I got uh, a thumbs up. That's great. We'll just wait another minute, let some people in. I think we could get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening. Um, we are here tonight to talk about how body mechanics relates to your golf swing. Just gonna let a couple more people in while, before I get going. Um, please virtually raise your hand if you're an avid golfer. Are there avid golfers in the group? I believe there's, oh, I got a couple. Is there any recreational golfers in this group? It's just a bunch of avid golfers. Yay for recreational golfers, that's fantastic. Um, my name is Renee Westmacott and I will be your host for the evening. I personally am not a golfer, but Dr. James Moitcher certainly is. Um, I wanna say, Good evening to Dr. James um, and share a few details about his expertise before we get started. Dr. James is a certified active release techniques chiropractor. In his practice, uh, Dr. James focuses on evidence-based rehab and prevention treatments. Dr. James is also a certified, or he's also certified by the Titleist Performance Institute. Uh, for those of you who do not know what that is, here are a few details about the Titleist Performance Institute. The Institute uh, uses a holistic approach and innovative techniques to help golfers improve their performance. And their mission is to be the world's premier golf player development center. So it sounds like a pretty uh, interesting place, um, definitely worth looking up. Dr. James is a wealth of knowledge with years of experience personally perfecting his own golf game and extensive expertise to support patients in their golf game. If any questions come up during tonight's lecture, feel free to write them into the chat box or raise your hand. I'll be standing by looking for the questions. We will also stay on the call afterwards in case um, questions come up at the end of the chat. Uh, that's all from me. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Moiter. All right. James. All right. I guess I can start talking. Can everybody hear me okay? Can everybody see the uh, slideshow in front of them? Just want to make sure everyone can see everything okay. Is that good for everybody? Perfect. Okay. So, um, best thing, I guess, just a uh, quick little housekeeping things. If anybody could please uh, mute their own sounds just in case things pop up. You don't want to become the the face of everybody in the talk by something happening or the kids in the background. So just mute the video and or pin the video to myself so you can make sure that you're not missing anything or not seeing or making sure that you see everything that we're going through. Um, but in terms of what we're here to talk about today is a little bit about the golf swing and a little bit about some common shot errors that typically occur because of this. So uh, as we already heard a little bit about me, uh, my name is Dr. James Modier. I'm a uh, chiropractor here at Active, Active Sports Therapy. Um, from Calgary, played golf in Calgary my entire life for the most part. I uh, got my first degree here and then moved out to Toronto for four years where I got my uh, doctorate of chiropractic. Uh, the golf is very different in both places, but both are excellent. Um, I'm also certified medically through the Titleist Performance Institute, which is really designed for golf swing biomechanics, rehabs and injury prevention. 
So first we'll, we'll start off with a little bit about uh, golf biomechanics and a little bit about the body and how things work and how it, how it corresponds to the golf. Um, so as all of us know, if we're either uh, professional golfers all the way down to amateur golfers, golf requires total 100% body motion. It requires various movement patterns around the entire body and every single time in a golf swing. And it's really important for us to really make sure that we're doing this safely and also repeatable to make sure that we can get those good shots constantly rather than having them in the bush on the left and all the way into the right as well, which is the last thing that we want too. So that sort of begs the question, is there a perfect swing or is there a perfect way to swing the golf club? And when it comes to the Titleist Performance Institute approach or the TPI approach, uh, there is no single best way to swing the golf club. Um, however, there is a most efficient way to swing the golf club and all that is based off how your body can move and what you can physically do. Uh, we've all seen and watched the pros uh, and there are huge variances in their golf swing. All you have to do is look at someone like Matt Wolf or Bryson DeChambeau, see their differences in their golf swing versus the perfect swing of someone like Adam Scott. And you'll see huge differences on how they swing, but they can all develop or all produce consistent force and properly put that into the golf ball to, to give that really good shot, which is what we're looking for. And that's why they're the best at it. So a little bit about that TPI approach. Uh, TPI came up with something called the body swing connection. And that's basically a fancy way of saying all your swing in golf is about is your ability's capacity to move and how that will influence your golf swing. Often poor swing mechanics or uh, poor swing patterns, poor shot placement, all these different things are caused or due to your body's inability to produce or do a specific motion. Um, for example, if you can't rotate properly, if you don't have the ability or the range of motion to be able to turn properly throughout either the backswing or transition or through the follow through or into your downswing and contact, these are gonna result in some issues with in terms of uh, force delivery, in terms of bad shot making, and just generally make things a lot harder on yourself and make things a lot more difficult to reproduce when you're trying to make those critically important golf shots. So going to the first part, then that most important thing is how the body moves. Your body and every body is basically boiling it down to the simplest factors, a series of alternating stable and mobile joints throughout the entire body. And this balance is super important for maintaining a good golf swing and coordinating it properly. All things that really all that make the biggest difference in terms of, I'm going to say it again, repeatability in your golf swing. No matter what club you're using, whether it's an eight iron or six iron, you want to make sure that you're hitting it the same way so that that shot is predictable and you can do the best that you can. As you can see from the kind of the picture here, the foot being a stable segment, the ankle being mobile, the knee being stable, the hip being mobile, the low back being stable, and all the way up to the, to the, all the way to the top of the head and all the way down to the arms as well. So what happens when one of these segments doesn't work properly? Say the knee gets a little bit more mobile or the hip isn't working properly, some, some through anything like an injury or surgery, or even just being born with a slightly different skeletal structure than somebody else. In that case, we tend to end up with compensations, right? These kinetic change is what we chain is what we call them of those uh, alternating segment, right? That force from a golf swing typically starts from the ground, works its way up. So if any point of this chain gets sort of interrupted or aggravated, injured, causes problems, then something else have to pick up the slack. And in this case, we call them compensations. So back to that example, what happens if something doesn't move the way it should? So say that hip, which is a, a really mobile segment, starts to, whether it's through arthritis, uh, hip replacement, surgeries, injuries, anything like that, no longer starts or continues to function as a very mobile joint, you can't move. Well, the compensation for that would be the segments above and below or the lower back and the knee tend to have to do a little bit more because the hip isn't doing its job. And in this case, those stable segments can start to get be, or can start to become a little bit more mobile, causing some aberrant movement patterns or some unexpected motions, as well as instability and possibly injury. All this being said, essentially, this can result in poor swing mechanics, 
poor repeatability in the golf swing, poor mobility, higher scores, and worst thing that we can have is pain or discomfort or injury. So going through the typical way we produce force through the golf swing. Sorry if this is a little, the graphs are a little physics-y and stuff like that, but essentially, like we were talking about, the way to deliver a force most efficiently to the golf ball. I mentioned it before a little bit, but typically what we'd like to see is that force that gets delivered to the golf ball coming from the ground up. That force starts with our feet, moves all the way up into our hips, our chest, our arms, eventually down into the club, gradually increasing the force as we go, almost like if you were to have a whip and that at the end of that nice little crack at the end, same thing happens in our golf swing. This chart basically just shows how that force is typically generated. So the red line being the hips, that's the first thing that goes in the downswing. Second thing that goes in the downswing is our chest following that rotation. Then it's our arms moving through. And then lastly, it's the club that delivers the, the total force to the golf ball. So that's just showing us generally through our downswing, we want this gradual increase in force and speed producing a lot of force at the golf ball. And once again, if you can get this down every single time repeating it, that's gonna make you a much more consistent golfer. So on this chart, we see something that's completely different. This is something that we'd see if something in this chain or this efficient generation of speed is broken in some way. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't play golf. It doesn't mean that you're gonna have horrible injuries or anything like that, but there's some efficiency being lost here in terms of speed, in terms of delivery, distance, everything that we wanna look at, and also possible some issues in terms of how we're moving the club and resulting in some of these bad shots. So in this case, we can see that the, the hips go first, which is good, but then it's our arms, the club, and lastly, it's the chest that comes through. So something in this, this chart or in this person's ability to swing the golf club is preventing them from turning their chest until they later. And so that's something we'd really wanna look at and seeing what's going on. So in this scenario, we might have somebody with a, a shoulder deficit. They might come over the top, they might get steep in their downswing, and that could result in a slice as well. So if what I haven't talked about already doesn't indicate it enough, golf is a hard sport. It's a, a sport of millimeters, inches, and degrees. And these things, these small errors can result in huge, dis, huge errors and huge misses, especially over long distances of like 300 yards. So it's really a game of inches and it's really important to try and get as, as consistent as you can because these variations will result in, in big misses. So everyone tends to think, well, what's the best way to fix a miss? Well, if you just hit it further, you're getting closer to the green, it will be less issues. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, we can't all be Bryson, but at the end of the day, if you look at some of Bryson's big holes, he makes some big numbers because he puts it so far out of bounds. So something as small as a five degree error. If you were to take a five degree error off straight line over 200 yards, which is your typical of maybe a little bit shorter than your typical average amateur golfer is about 17 yards offline. So that could be, if you're looking at a 15 yard fairway, you're just off the fairway, not too big of a deal. But if you take that same five degree error and extrapolate that over 300 yards, now you're 26 yards offline. And that's the difference between just off the fairway and in the trees. And that's really gonna be a bit of a problem. So even something as small as five degrees makes a big difference when it comes to how we make our shots around the golf course. And this five degree error doesn't account for spin on the golf ball. Uh, that's just a straight line shot. That's if there's no motion to it whatsoever. As soon as you add spin to that golf ball, you add some rollout to it, an unfortunate bounce, those sort of things, these errors can compound even more significantly. So the longer you have time in the air with that golf ball, there's more time to curve, there's more time to curve and more likelihood of a bad error or a bad kind of end to that golf shot, which is not what we want. So getting to the, the meat of what we're talking about today, uh, what are some of the major common golf shot faults that we see? Now that image on the right there can seem a little bit daunting. There's a lot of different colors, a lot of different shot shapes. The thing is not all of these are bad. We like to hit a straight. We like to hit a fade or a draw in some of these situations where we need to. But the bad shots that we're really looking at today are 
the top or a fin, the duff or the fat, that dreaded driver prop pop up where you just get hitting a sandwich off the, the tee box there, which nobody enjoys. The classic slice that everybody typically likes to see, which most amateur golfers will tend to have, um, the shank, and then the hook as well. So starting with the first one, the top or the fin, this is that typical low running golf shot. The one that just is impossible to control where it's going. It could go left, it could go right, but typically it ends up either running down the fairway, either 10 to 15 feet, or if you hit it to some degree, not super, super badly, at least you can get at least maybe about a hundred yards of run on the fairway if it's a good warm day and not too wet. The worst part about this shot is that sometimes if it's a cold day, especially right now in shoulder season where we're going from a blizzard to a plus 18 degree day and it's a little bit cooler on one of those days, it can be really painful on the hands. That reverberation comes all the way up. Not what we want. Sometimes can even result in some injuries in the hands, some jarring motions. Not what we really want to see. It's sort of brother in terms of shot shapes and or shot errors in this case is the duff. Rather than hitting up on the ball or hitting it too early and thinning it, we take too much, take too much ground, too early. We take that big, deep beaver tail of a divot that tends to go flying in the air and the ball doesn't go very far either. Now with the duff or with any of these shots, it all depends on the severity. Uh, in some cases, you can take a huge strip of dirt and you don't even hit the golf ball and it doesn't even move a foot. In other cases, you can hit pretty close to the golf ball, just hitting it a little bit fat, still getting the majority of your golf shot off, but still nonetheless, it's gonna reduce the ability of you to deliver the force of the golf ball properly. It's gonna reduce your distance. And once again, make your consistency a lot more difficult. In the case of the duff as well, it's really important to really look at how jarring it can be. If we take a really big impact before the golf ball, it can be jarring on the hands and the forearms and even the back too, just because of that quick stop. As we all know, speed doesn't kill. It's that sudden stop that gets you. And that's really the issue here is that quick stop hitting that wall that's going to cause a lot of problems. This can only get worse too if you happen to hit a tree root that is just hiding underneath the surface of the ground that you can't see and it really stops you instantly. You can break clubs, you can really hurt your back or you can hurt any parts of your body, which is really what we want to avoid. And then the last one of this sort of uh, trio of bad shots that we really want to talk about because they all kind of go together is that driver pop up. Now you guys will have to bear with my wonderful Photoshop skills here on the right. It's not, not a very good job. I apologize. But the way we hit our drivers and the way we hit our irons are very different. Um, with our drivers, we like to hit up on the ball and maximize how much height we're getting, maximize the distance, maximize the carry. Whereas an iron, we like to hit down on the ball. So the two are very different. And sometimes we get sort of in the same sort of routine of how we hit shots and it doesn't always work out that well. So you can see on that image there, the first sort of the main part of the image, the good part of the image, that driver's coming up nicely, meeting the golf ball to make sure that that force gets delivered properly. In my Photoshop, my really good looking image there of my just white golf ball and driver head there, you can see that that driver has not had the amount of time to start moving up into the golf ball yet. And it's actually still flat. In that scenario with the golf ball being the same height on that tee, we're just going to brush the top of our driver and that's going to add loft, making it like a sand wedge off that tee box, which nobody likes. So often this is highly dependent on ball position. Um, try hitting the driver up or topping the driver even is very dependent on where you put that T, that T position in your stance. If it's in the middle of your stance, it's sometimes a little bit too far back. And in that scenario, you've shallowed out the club right at that sort of ball point. It doesn't have, it hasn't had the time to come up yet. And that's gonna result in that problem. Moving it more forward, kind of off the inside of that lead knee or the lead knee, the lead heel, that's going to really kind of allow you to hit up on the golf ball. And if you go too far forward, past the toe, now you've come up too high and you're likely just going to top the golf ball and that's not going to be what we like to see. So in terms of all these cluster shots, the, the top and the duff, and then on top of that, even the driver pop-up, what we're really looking at and a real big determining factor of what causes these bad shots is essentially the low point of the swing. 
is where that low point happens. And the low point is basically where the club, the club hits its lowest point in your swing before it starts coming back up. It's coming all the way down through your transition and all the way through your downswing. And then as you get into your follow through, that club starts to come back up. The low point is, as the name implies, the lowest point of that swing. In terms of the top and the duff, in, this, in these two scenarios here, this point is shifted backwards from the golf ball. As you can see from the image there with the golf ball sitting kind of in the middle, the black line is how we would normally like to see our shots happen. Clubbing, club is coming down, slowly coming in, and then gradually strikes the golf ball before hitting the dirt, taking a divot after the golf ball. In the case of a top versus a duff, that low point is shifted backwards. So now in the case of a duff or that red line, we're shallowing out too early, taking that strip of dirt beforehand, resulting in a poor strike. When it comes to the top, we're once again shallowing it out too low, but this time we're not even getting low enough to make contact with the ground. So as the club is coming up, we only have the ability to hit the top or the middle of the golf ball resulting in that skull, that top or that thin shot, which is not what we wanna hit. So in terms of what causes the low point to be shifted backwards or forwards or anything like that, this can be multifactorial, it can be a couple different things. Like we talked about before, it could be ball positioning and it can also be swing and body positioning, things that make this change. So as we talked about with the driver already a little bit, ball positioning is a huge important factor. For most irons, you wanna have it nice in the center of your golf swing, right in the center of your stance and in the center of your feet. As you sort of move up to maybe a, a seven iron, six iron, five iron, that might move a ball forward, two balls forward, three balls forward. Depending on how you swing the club, that's generally where we'd like to see it. Whereas the driver comes off that lead heel. So as I said before, in the golf driver pop-up, that ball is typically moved too far back. We end up coming and shallowing it out too early. That club hasn't had a chance to come up to the tee yet, resulting in that ball shooting straight up into the air, which is not what we want. In terms of the top and the duff, however, that ball tends to get moved a little bit too far forward. So if we place the golf ball the same place that we would put it for our driver, for example, if that is off our lead heel, we're already leaning so far forward now into our golf swing that if we come back and sway even slightly off of our typical line alignment of being forward on that golf ball, and that low point hits too early, that's gonna be our problem with either hitting that thin by coming up too high or hitting that duff by coming down too low too quickly, resulting in hitting the dirt quickly. So that's sort of ball positioning, but what about the body causes for these sort of shot shapes that we tend to see or those duffs, those driver pop-ups and the thins. So typically what tends to happen is we are artificially trying to lift up the golf ball. Uh, everyone's had it with an issue before hitting a, a duff or hitting a top where it's really frustrating when you can't get the ball in the air and all you do is dribble it down 25 feet or hundred yards or something like that. It's one of the worst things that we can see, right? It's very difficult. We all want to see the ball get up in the air and fly. So we try and make it happen. So when that happens, we either hang back trying to artificially lift the golf ball up into the air, or we try and scoop it really quickly to really get that loft underneath the club and lift it up, or even chicken wing our lead elbow to try and lift the golf club and lift the ball up together, trying to really get this height up. The issue with all these kind of compensations of trying to lift the ball is we're not letting the club do the work. The club is lofted. There's a reason it has a amount of degrees of loft to it. And that's what determines the ball's height and spin. We don't want to add that with our own body anguish of leaning or scooping or lifting. Because what that's going to do is it's going to throw off where our club actually shallows out so that just the loft of it itself can determine the ball flight. So the first one that we want to talk about is, is hanging back. So as you can see between that image there, the first one, the guy on the left there is hanging back. He's really far forward. You can even see that three wood is almost in a top position already. That club is already lifting itself up before it's even gotten to the golf ball because his body is preventing it from contacting the golf ball properly. Versus on that the other image there, if I'm actually delivering that force properly moving forward, that club is gonna contact properly and about either 12 to 15 degrees on that 
free wood is going to cause the lift of that golf ball. So this constantly produces loss of power and distance and, and ball flight inconsistencies because of this, right? If we're now topping the golf ball, that's going to be a problem. Or if we're, if we do actually tend to make good contact with it, now we're going to sky the golf ball too high and it's not going to be normal for what we'd like to see with that golf club or losing distance. Additionally, in terms of, uh, injury mechanics and stuff like that. This is not a position that we want to be in. What we often like to, or what we often tend to see in this position is an excessive load into that trail hip in the back. You can see how much lean he has on that left side image. And that's causing a lot of compression, causing a lot of twisting and rotation and torque on his lower back. So in this case, sometimes if we can't rotate properly, we kind of fall back because we hit that, well, that stop. If our lead hip, just looking forward here, just if our lead hip can't turn properly, then we're going to have issues with loading into that hip, getting forward, and we're going to hang back, resulting in these poor shot shapes like that duff, like that top, or like that driver pop up, which we don't want to do. The other thing that I kind of mentioned here is, is scooping. This is basically where we just scoop the hands over or really quickly flip the hands over to try and artificially gain or lift the golf ball. Now, as it shows in the image here, basically what you can see is that lead wrist flexes or sorry, cups really hard or extends really aggressively. So that's basically taking your knuckles and throwing them forwards towards the target. At the same time, that trail hand really flexes hard, turning the hands and turning it towards the target. Once again, really trying to lift and flip the club over to get that lip or the lift on that golf ball. The issue with this, as you can imagine, is either number one, we're going to shallow out too early, or in most cases, we're going to actually lift the golf club up too quickly and top the golf ball. Now, once again, like a lot of these poor positions that we tend to get into, there's a possibility of injuries as well. In this scenario, one that we're looking at right now, is typical lateral or and medial epicondylitis for golfers and tennis elbow. So golfers and tennis elbow, if anyone's ever had it before, is really, really painful. It's not comfortable and it can drastically affect your even ability to play this sport. Uh, if it's too painful to even grip the golf club, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to actually get through a full 18 if you can't even swing or hold on the golf club properly. And this epicondylitis is really due to the fact of a really forced extension or flexion while gripping something really tightly. So if you were to just hold your hands together or even hold a golf club as tight as you possibly can, and then try and turn the face open and closed really quickly, it's going to be very difficult to do so. Versus if you were to hold it a little bit lighter, like a, a five or, or a four out of 10, all of a sudden you're going to be able to move quite a bit faster. And that's really what we want to focus on when it comes to the golf swing is really being able to have a nice loose transition, allow the face to turn over, rather than scoop it and really forcefully jam that club face to get the lift. And the last one is in terms of this set of, of, of poor shot shapes is the chicken wing. And that's that lead arm lifting up instead of really doing that sort of scoop. And in fact, a lot of times the two end up going together. You see someone who scoops, they'll typically chicken wing that arm up to once again, artificially lift that golf club or that, that ball off of the dirt. So naturally that's going to result in that, that low point of the swing changing or even coming up too high, resulting in a top, which most often than not in someone who's really struggling or starting to get into the game, the top is the number one thing that we see. People are, are actually scared to hit the ground where we do want to take that divot. It's just where we take that divot. We want it to be after the golf ball, not before it. So a lot of these things trying to artificially lift the golf ball are people or amateurs trying to avoid hitting the ground and artificially lift that golf ball. And this is one of those things as well. It goes really along with the scoop. And so injuries can occur the similar way with that lateral and medial or golfers and tennis elbow type thing. So this is now probably the number one things that we typically see is the big banana hooks and the banana slices in most cases. So we're going to talk primarily about a right-handed golfer here. So lefties, if any of you are out there, basically just flip everything to the opposite direction because it's going to be backwards for you a little bit, which gets a little bit tricky, but we're just going to focus on the, the right-handed so it can make the most sense. We're just going to flip everything over for a lefty. 
So for a right-hander, the slice is probably the most common amateur fault. That's your weekend warrior golfer, plays a handful of times a year. Super, super, super common. And essentially what this is for a right-handed golfer, at least, is the ball traveling excessively or spinning to the right or away from you. So that kind of goes along with the progression of the fade. The ball fades away from your body. A slice is a really excessive fade where that ball almost goes diagonally across the sky. Most common way to lose a golf ball, most common loss of distance. It happens incredibly frequently. Number one thing we most see and the number one thing people really want the most help with. A hook is the complete opposite. So that ball comes across, across your body and it travels excessively to the left. So this is once again is a progression of the draw. And the draw for most people or most right-handed golfers or even left-handed golfers as well is a desirable shot shape. It gives a little bit more forward spin, a little bit more top spin. Ball typically travels a little bit further, which is what we like and is typically ends up being a little bit more controllable. However, a hook of that excessively pulling it across your body typically ends up being that low hook that doesn't go very far or just ends up in the trees or the bushes on the left. So when it comes to looking at the slice and the hook or pretty much any ball flight factor that goes through the sky, there are two main critical factors for any shot shape. Now this might be a little bit simple, but we're trying to dial it down to the most key factors here, just trying to minimize things because we don't want to be thinking about too many things when we take our golf swings. The first thing is our club path angle or our club path, just generally where it goes. And there's two major ways to happen here. So in to out, which means over the top, a little bit steep, where that club comes from away from you and cuts across the golf ball towards you, or out to in, which is more of a flat swing plane, the ball or the club slowly starts close to your body, gradually pushing it out towards the right. So the second thing we really need to look at is the club face angle and how this works relative to our club path. So when it comes to open versus closed, it's always in relation to our club path. There is variances depending on how things go, but if the club path is straight and our club path is open, that means it's open to the path. So you can either have it straight, open or closed or neutral essentially is the, the three main sort of ways that this go. And interactions between these two factors will always determine your ball spin and your ball flight. So looking at club face control. So when it comes to really controlling how our club or how our face interacts with the golf ball or how our path does, grip is the number one concern. It's the only part of our body that is in contact with the golf club. As such, it will determine the club face angle as we go throughout the golf swing. So our golf grip, like our uh, club face, is categorized into three main things. So there's neutral. Then there's the strong grip and there's the weak grip. This does not kind of relate to, this does not relate at all to how firmly you are gripping the club. As I mentioned before, if you are strangling the life out of that golf club, it's going to be really hard to turn and manage that club face versus a little bit lighter of a grip. You're going to be able to turn it a lot easier. The grip control and the grip sort of how it's held is all determined on hand positioning rather than how firmly you're gripping the uh, club and that we'll talk about a little bit further when it comes down to issues of the, the slice and the hook as well. So firstly, let's talk about the slice. So what, as I said before, one of the most common swing faults of an amateur. In this case, our club path is that out to in or over the top type swing path. Typically seen a lot of times because our upper body gets too quick and our lower body isn't doing the amount of work. So we end up trying to take a slap shot over the golf ball and really smash that club and deliver the amount of force, as much force in that golf ball as we can. Kind of like swinging an ax, which is what we don't really want to do. In this case, our club face is always open to that swing path. So our club is coming across, as it shows in the picture series for a right-handed golfer, you can see how the club face or the club path as the two arrows around each club is pulling to the left. And then if our club face is open to that club path, that's what's going to prevent or cause that right side spin of the golf ball built in that sort of starting left banana slice all the way to the right, missing the hole or missing the fairway by a considerable margin. 
When it comes to grip, this is what we would consider a weak grip. So what that means is when it comes to strength of a grip, it's all about how many knuckles you can see on your lead hand. We'll talk about this a little bit further, but typically coincides with a weak grip. And this as well with that open club face means that the heel is leading first. If you have a slice typically or more often than not, you're gonna be contacting with the heel of the golf club before anywhere else because that's the leading edge. The issue with this as well, when you start leading with the heel of the golf club is the shank. That pausal really starts to come into play when we start to really open up this club face and that can result in an even more disastrous golf shot. So the shank and the slice, the two often go hand in hand. As you can see by those kind of club faces there and how they sort of sit, when you hit it square, that middle of the club face or every part of that club face is contacting with the golf ball squarely. And it's gonna really give a good sort of neutral and middle of the club face contact. As Soon as you start to open the club face or that top image, you can see how that heel is the leading edge that tends to come first versus if you're closed, the toe edge is the one that tends to come first. So if our heel comes too far forward with the golf club here, if, any, if you guys can see, Hitting that part of the golf club, the golf club really sharply bananas away from this position. If you hit there, that's what we would consider a shank hitting that hosel. And so the shank, as we mentioned, hitting that hosel and that heel of the golf club resulting in that 45 plus degree miss hit straight to the right. This is the shot that when you hit it, you don't even know what happened. It basically just goes straight to the right and you're left looking at the golf ball like, oh geez, what the heck did I just do? So once again, this is that typical slice swing path that over the top or out to in cutting across the golf ball resulting in these issues. And so that pausal leads off first and that ball shoots straight across, which is not what we want. So really having control of our club face will help reduce the instance of a shank hitting that pausal. So in terms of what causes these sort of over the top or out to in swing paths. The biggest thing is one of them is early extension. So these are the swing issues now that we're gonna be going through about what causes these slices. So early extension is described as a, a forward pelvic motion throughout the swing. So in these two images, once again, shows pretty well. On the first side, if you were to draw a line straight from the, the person's butt, essentially, that's where we'd like the body to stay. Make sure that we're maintaining our posture throughout our golf swing giving our arms a whole lot of space to get to the golf ball properly. And so as you come down, it allows you to keep your hands low. If the club doesn't come over to the top, doesn't result in that in to, or out to end swing path. So also with reducing the space here, there's a possibility of poor rotational causes to this or anything like that. So what we really are looking at here is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here really quickly, just so I can show you guys this. So I'm gonna take off my headphones really fast, but essentially if we're looking at a golf swing, if, is this gonna, am I gonna have enough space in here? Maybe, maybe not, okay. So if I'm looking at my space to the golf ball here, lower that down a little bit, good, perfect. So my typical space to the golf ball is from about my chest to that golf ball. If I, on my transition, start coming forward, I can no longer get this club to shallow out low. If I can stay back through my golf swing, I now have all of this space to allow my hands to come out towards that golf ball. Early extension can be just a, a swing mechanic where you just come forward a little bit too much, or it can be a result of this lead hip, not being able to turn, hitting that wall, and standing up which can be a bit of a problem as well. So we'll go back to sharing the screen here. Good. Perfect. So really one of the most important aspects of kind of a slice is giving yourself the space to get the club from an in position to an out position. If you're really coming over the top and you're reducing the space, this might be a problem here. It can also result in some injuries, right? Like we talked about with hanging back. Anytime we throw our hips too far forward or anytime we really compress or extend that lower back, 
increases in compression, increases in rotation, these things can really become a bit of a problem as well. So as we talked about, we kind of went through this a little bit already in the, in the uh, early extension aspect, but definitely an initial rotation of that upper body, that lower body isn't doing very much. So in terms of that nice red swing plane in this image, we're getting too far on top of that and the club gets super, super vertical. There's no way now to shallow out that club and come from the inside delivering a, a neutral or straight swing path. It's always going to be across the golf ball, reducing speed, reducing uh, smash factor or efficiency in your golf swing and resulting in that slice more often than not. So here we're talking about the grip a little bit or a weak grip essentially. So in this case, what we're really looking at is if any grip, how many knuckles can we see on our lead hand? If we can't see any knuckles on that lead hand, it's what we would consider a weak grip. So it's more likely that our hands are gonna roll open versus keep that cup club face closed. So, or which also you can see is that trail hand tends to roll over top, really trying to close it down. But in that scenario, we're just gonna run out of space as well. And the only way we can get that club or any sort of wrist motion is to open the golf bay, or open the golf club, which once a lot of times ends up with that slice. Another way of looking at this rather than knuckles and stuff like that is if you actually grab your golf club, what happens is what we consider uh, V's. So looking at the golf club here, when you make a good grip, where your club and your fingers interact, it kind of makes a point or a V. And where that points will determine what kind of grip you have. If you're not seeing any knuckles here, oftentimes that V or that line is pointing directly to your lead shoulder. And then vice versa, when, or even when you start gripping tightly over with the right hand, that's going to once again point to the lead shoulder, resulting in an open club face. So you will either only ever hit a neutral club face, which is if you can get your hands right back to that exact position, or you'll end up resulting in, a, in a, an open club face, either a shank or a slice, putting that spin on the golf ball. So now coming into the complete opposite range of that slice, the hook. So pretty much everything is completely flipped from the slice into the hook. So rather than an out to in club path for the slice, we're looking at an in to out club path. Rather than an open face, we're looking at a closed face to that path. Rather than a weak grip, we're looking at a strong grip. Rather than the heel strikes, we're looking at toe strikes. Now, a lot of times people tend to think that the hook or the, the pull or anything like that is an easier shot to fix just because of how strong the grip is. If you can always weaken a grip, it kind of gives a little bit more ability to move the wrists. Things tend to, to get a little bit easier. This, tends to be if you're really turning the club face down, you can ease that off a little bit. So it tends to be a slightly easier shot to fix compared to the slice. But we'll still go with some of these things that tend to cause issues or body mechanics that we tend to see causing these hooks. So the first one that we're looking at, same sort of thing with that uh, we talked about a little bit earlier is something that happens with the duffs and happens with the tops is hanging back. Additionally to moving that low point, basically what we really need to do is to avoid shallowing out too early, we need to kind of really flatten our golf swing. If we stay too vertical and we hang back, we're just gonna take a monster divot because we're coming too steep at the golf ball. So when we shallow out our golf path or our golf swing, typically that club is gonna come from more the inside, swing around our body and push out to the right, resulting in that sort of into out swing path. And if we have that closed space with it too, that's when we get that pull or that hook coming across the side there. So it's a more flat, a more round swing, not as steep as the slice. So this is what kind of tends to happen as long as we're making good contact with the ball, because the last thing we want to do is to contact with the ground first. Another aspect of the hook or swing from that path of into out, if this is what we would we're talking about more in terms of issues with the swing rather than things that are good is getting stuck. So what happens by getting stuck as you can tell by the image there, the lady in the photo really keeps her posture well, is maintaining good posture, but her hips are so far forward from the golf ball or from her arms and her upper body that there's a too big of a disconnect. 
So in that case, you can see her, her trail elbow is almost still on the small of her back. It's almost on her backside. So from this perspective, it really forces her to force that golf club out. And to save that shot from going straight right, because the swing path is so far to the out, you really have to swing the hands over and what's typically results in what's called a handsy hook. Where you really turn the hands over, closing the club face aggressively. And that's what gives you that full banana hook from that right to left, which is not what we'd like to see. Additionally, we can go with the strong grip now. So unlike the weak, we can see at least three to four knuckles on the lead hand. On the trail hand, it's almost like it's gripping underneath the club rather than on top of it, as you can see in the image here. And those thumb, thumb and finger Vs all point towards the trail shoulder. So this is something that really, when you kind of take the club back and set the grip into a neutral position, right? If you're starting way over here in a kind of strong grip position where you can see all your knuckles, as soon as you take it back, that's gonna close the club face. So if you guys can see with my club here, as soon as I set that into neutral, that club face closes naturally. So if we're gripping too strongly, and we see too many knuckles for our swing, that can result in a too far closed club face for our path, resulting in that spin to the left and really hooking it over to the left. So a little bit easier now, we're kind of coming out of these errors and becoming a little bit more um, easier to fix in terms of the pull hook and the push slice. The pull hook, essentially, the reason these are easier to fix is because when it comes to these, our club path and our kind of club face are more in sync. So for the pull hook, rather than our club face or our club path, sorry, coming over, or uh, sorry, yeah, rather than our club path coming from the in to out, pushing that to the right and then pulling it over that big, that big hook, our club path is either straight or more along the slice club path of over the top or out to in. In this case though, rather than the open club face for the slice, we're actually closing that club face down so that once again, it's all about where that club face and our path are oriented together. If we're close to that over the top path, we're just gonna pull it and pull it to the side as well. Easier to fix because a lot of times we only really need to focus on our club path at this point rather than the club face. Same thing with the push slice. When we're coming from that in to out pathway for our swing and the club face is a little bit open for that, it's gonna start either neutral or slightly out to the right and then just gradually fade away from there going straight to the right. Now, if this is really aggressive, it can make the shot even worse. But once again, if we just get that club path or the club face slightly more in line here, this swing, this swing kind of issue will tend to go away, which is good. So when it comes to the pull hook and the push slice, these are typically, like I said, typically easier to fix as the swing path and the club face are typically a little bit more matched up together. So we either only need minor corrections to either the path or the swing, not both of them at once. These are sort of on the mend of, or on the way to fixing these big meshes like the slice and like the hook. So Generally, when it comes to fixing errors of our golf swing. So we've gone through a lot of those major, major issues. So what about fixing them? Well, when it comes to changing anything in our golf swing, it's really important that we go slowly. I know we all want to just eliminate the slice right away or eliminate the hook, eliminate the top. That being said, if we start throwing too many things at you, at you or trying to change too many things, it becomes a lot more difficult. So trying to change five to 10 aspects simultaneously really compl complicates things more than it needs to. What we really want to do is we want correct gradual building blocks to really make sure that you're growing the way we should see things go rather than having big massive changes where you have 10 to 15 swing thoughts. Things are a little bit iffy when you're standing over the ball and you just forget about everything and just whack it, which is not what we want to do. So in a lot of these fixes, what we'd like to see is gradual type things. So when it comes to the slice or the uh, hook, we'll talk about the slice primarily because it's the most common one. 
What we'd like to see first is rather than you continuing to banana slice it, is to actually just straight pull it every single time. So by that, it's all about club face control, right? We wanna make sure that you're pulling first and then we can gradually force that path a little bit more neutral. But with anything in the golf swing, the most important aspect for us is posture and mobility. We wanna make sure that you're able to swing the golf club and swing it properly and not get into any injury prone positions. So that's how you're standing over the golf ball, making sure your setup is proper to make sure that you're, you're starting off the golf swing in a good position. If you're too far close to your target or if you're too far open to your target, these are things that once again, these swing issues with the, we're talking about the kinetic chain moving up from the ground to the club. If we start in a bad posture, things can only compound and get worse from that position. So we really wanna make sure that your swing and posture is good. Then we wanna look at that club face control, right? Getting that banana slice into more of that pull, making sure that these errors are tend to starting to progress, right? That pull, we still don't wanna hit it, but it's better than the slice. Then the last step would be that swing path alteration, making sure that we dial in how we're hitting the ball and at what angle when our club face and our path are already matched up, resulting in that nice straight shot, a little bit of a fade, a little bit of a draw, whatever your natural or preferred shot shape might be. So really looking at, like we talked about a little bit already, is that number one kind of factor in influencing our golf swing and poor mechanics is our posture. How we set up the golf ball? Are we too close? Are we too far? How much space do we have? that's gonna determine how we're able to deliver our club to the golf ball. Like we talked about with early extension, if we're standing too close to the golf ball, we don't have enough space to get that club shallow and come from that in to out path, we're gonna either stand up or we're gonna come straight across because it's the only way that we can. Additionally, it's really, really important to preventing these errors from compounding and also preventing injuries as well. If we're in a good starting position, it's likely that our body is prepared for these sort of swing mechanics. It's not likely we're going to get in a bad position, over compressing, over injuring, anything like that, which is what we want. And that kind of goes into that proper tissue loading, proper strengthening of the muscles and tendons around the area to make sure that you're able to do things properly. So in a lot of cases, set up, set up and posture, a lot of times can fix a lot of these issues. As long as we're just getting in the right position, a lot of things down the chain will fall into place. Second aspect to posture and just being able to swing normally is joint mobility and stability. Like we talked about in the beginning, our body is that alternating segments of stable and mobile joints. And we really need to make sure that we keep this balance in check. Every joint is specific and has a, a defined range of motion that it can travel to. And this, while it does vary person to person and ability of how you're gonna swing, you don't wanna exceed that range of motion and cause problems or injury and then nonetheless, you want to make sure that you're doing this controlled. If you go too far and it's wild, arching that back and compressing the back, things are going to get hurt. But if you can do things controlled slowly and actively, the less likelihood things are going to get into an injured position, make sure that you're able to kind of move through the range of motion. You have the flexibility that you need to, to produce a good golf swing and make sure you're strong enough to support yourself in those positions as well. So lack of control and that kind of poor movement coordination can really result in injuries and pain, which is the number one thing we want to avoid when it comes to the golf swing. Bad shots are fine as long as you're still able to play the game. If you are too painful to even get up and grab a club, everything about proper swing mechanics and how to hit the ball on a poor shot doesn't matter anymore at that point. So it's really important to make sure that we're able to play the game first without pain before we get into these really nitty gritty swing issues. And as you can see by the slide, I like to use it quite a bit. Basically the change in golf fitness and how things have really changed in the last 40, 50 years of the sport. You used to have a guy like John Daly who would be out there smoking cigarettes on the golf course, drinking beers on the professional tour and being able to do well. Nowadays, we see guys like Brooks Kepka, we see guys like Dustin Johnson, Rory McIlroy, where Focusing on mobility, focusing on strength, focusing on support and stability is one of the most critical and important aspects in the golf game. And that's why guys like Bryson DeChambeau can hit it ungodly distances somehow and still maintain and rather don't get injured too much, which is what we really want to see. 
So the keys to basically anything in terms of uh, making sure that we're able to play this game is our endurance, how long we can go for it. How, so many times we get halfway through our game and then we end up with issues about ninth hole, 10th hole, where back starts to get a little sore, our grip gets a little sore, we're starting to feel it in our elbows because we're gripping the club too tight. So we really wanna make sure we have that good baseline endurance to make sure that we're able to play the game. Then obviously strength. The stronger we are, the more force we can produce, the farther we can hit the ball, all good things. Now, once again, we wanna make sure that we're strong enough to keep up with these motions and we're not injuring ourselves. If we don't have strength and control, we're gonna have issues when it comes to injuries, jamming the low back, those sort of things, smashing into the ground. Strength is useless without control. And that's where we go into that control mobility, right? Strength is useless without control. We wanna be able to make sure we're going through these range of motions, not forcing ourselves into injury prone positions, not making sure we're jamming any of these joints, jamming our forearms, jamming our back, anything like that. All of these together will really help to increase our consistency, reduce injuries and keep you playing longer, which is really the whole point about golf. All right, that's pretty much it guys. That's, that's everything I pretty much have. Does anybody have any questions, concerns, anything like that? I, I haven't had a chat box up, so I have no idea if anything has been going on, so. That was great, James. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. I'm curious if uh, anyone in the crowd uh, has any questions. Um, what would be an example? I guess I do. Um, what would be okay. an example that say I'm a golfer, I want to come in and have a treatment. Um, is yeah. there a specific treatment plan that you offer uh, for patients that kind of does a top to bottom overview? Like what would that look like, I guess is what I'm trying okay. to. So like, like everything and like that TPI approach, uh, everything is very individualistic. So there's, there's not a, a, a one size fit, fits all solution for every single person. Um, for someone who slices versus someone that has a, a hook or someone that is just coming in for pain in their golf swing, we're really going to have to address that from an individual basis. So the best thing that we can do is obviously if the weather is nice, we can go outside and I typically with a high speed camera, I get somebody to swing and see what their swing looks like. If, are they over the top? Are they doing any of these sort of injury causing mechanics? that are really a big issue, we'll look at those and kind of address, okay, that's what's happening in your swing that's likely causing maybe some of your injuries or some of your problems. And then from there, basically what we do is deconstruct that into how your body moves that's causing these issues. Because a lot of times, while sometimes, yeah, it's, it's just a, a technique problem. A lot of times we actually end up with body mechanics issues that tend to cause these issues. So if I can't rotate into my lead hip, I'm going to stand up to avoid pinching in my lead hip or that injury. So in that case, we need to either work on hip flexibility, hip mobility, allowing that person to get into that internal rotation or get through their range of motion without causing pain. And a lot of times if we can do that and kind of resolve some of these mobility issues or strengthening issues, the swing path tends to get a little bit better or things tend to improve because they're no longer hitting that stop or they're no longer hitting that wall that allows them to swing a little bit more fluidly, or if they're taking lessons that allows their coach to work a little bit better with them and allowing them to get a little bit more in the positions that they might need to be in for their golf swing. So we would go through a, a little bit of a, a swing look if we can, if the weather's nice, if not having a video of their swing is great on the phone. And then in here, we'd go through a full sort of body mechanics, look at how their motion is, how their hip flexibility is. Are they having issues with rotation? Are they having issues with flexion extension? And then that'll really determine where we go in terms of injury prevention and, and uh, kind of treatment plans to make them feeling a little bit better, reduce their pain and get them working a little bit better through their golf swing. That's great. Thank you so much, um, Dr. James. Um, that was a wealth of information, especially um, from a non-golf perspective. Um, okay, I, well, I, got, I, got, I got a chat question here. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. we did, I see it. So uh, for comes, in terms of stretching and warm up before a game or practice, do you have any suggestions? So once again, very individualistic, depending on what you have issues with. Uh, a lot of good stretches that I like to do are really rotationally based. So when it comes to golf, it's a heavy rotational sport, right? 
constantly turning into the, the ball, constantly trying to produce as much power as you, can, as you can. So naturally, working on the rotational aspects of your swing is probably the best thing that you can do. A lot of times, people's warm-ups, they, they get to the golf course and they just hit a bucket of balls, and that's their warm-up. So in that case, your warm-up for golf is golf. We, we want to actually have these muscles and body trying to swing the golf club rather than just swinging for, for work. So in terms of a good stretch, what I like to do is just a standard rotational stretch here. So I'll kind of try and show you guys here. It's not the easiest with uh, how things are set up in the office, but if you can basically sit nice and tall, feet and knees together, locking out the pelvis, really focusing on the upper body, what we get you to do is cross your arms across the chest here, making sure that that lower body stays as stable as possible. From here, we're gonna rotate as far as we can until we feel a little bit of tension. I don't want you to go super far and feel like you're really straining yourself. All the while, well, through that turn, everything stays stable here. So once we hit our end range, what we're gonna do is tilt at the rib cage. So we're gonna actually lean to the side. And from there, five, 10 big deep breaths, really trying just to relax into this position, that sort of tension through the ribs on both sides should subside a little bit. From there, without rotating, you're gonna come back up and then you're gonna turn further. And you guys can tell already, just by me doing that, how much further I could actually rotate. So what this is doing, obviously doing this on both sides is good as well, but what this is doing is it's really priming all of our rotational muscles our external obliques, a lot of these different tissues that are responsible for force generation and rotation, we're stretching them out like you would in your backswing or through your follow through, and then asking them to work. That's building that brain body connection of really trying to help coordinate how these muscles work, especially in those extreme ranges. And it's going to give you a little bit more extra range. You're going to feel a little bit looser before you start swinging on the golf club as well the muscles of your rotation and of your core and of your trunk are gonna be a little bit more primed for that. So that's probably the number one stretch that I get to a lot of my golfers. It really makes a big difference beforehand. And this exercise is not just tailored for golf. If you're a hockey player, uh, baseball, tennis, any rotational sport, it's really, really important to kind of work through that as well. Any Great, thank you. Um... Any further questions? I think that is probably all for now. Um, thanks. Oh, there's one more. Yeah. Okay. So tennis, tennis elbows and stretches and stuff like that. Okay. So uh, first thing is if you are currently playing with tennis or golfer's elbow, uh, or any sort of uh, sport, if you're in the gym with tennis elbow, if you're golfing with tennis elbow, tennis, anything like that. The number one thing that we want to do is while we're actually doing our sport or doing our activity is making sure that we're not gripping too tight. If we grip the club far too tightly, like I mentioned before, it's going to be really hard for us to turn our hands. But additionally, the more tension we put through here, the more tension is going to put here on this, on the, the lateral aspect of the elbow, as well as the inside of the elbow. Things are going to be a lot, a lot of tension through here. And as we turn through the golf swing or really controlling our club face, even more tension comes from here. So the first thing is when it comes to playing, really loosening up our grip a little bit, making sure we're not strangling the life out of the club. That should take some strain or some tension off the elbow. Secondly, when it comes to stretches or anything like that, I like to do what's called a, uh, a pale or rail or a, a PNF stretch, essentially. There's big acronyms, but essentially it's, uh, isometric loading is what we're going through, through a range of motion. So from here, I'll kind of show you off to the edge. So don't have a lot of space with the table here. Good. So from this position, I'm going to brace my elbow on my knee here. What we're doing is we're going to load these tissues under some tension, trying to bring some blood, some oxygen, some nutrients to help it heal, but in a safe controlled way. We're not strengthening too hard. We're not pushing really, really firmly we're only going to our tolerance to make sure things aren't so bad. So in this case, hand's gonna be nice and loose, once again, because we don't wanna be increasing the tension by squeezing super hard. Hand nice and loose. 
The other hand is just gonna sit on top of the knuckles, just kind of like that, essentially, just sitting nicely on top of the knuckles, just to give it a little bit of resistance. The top hand is not gonna do any work. It's only gonna meet resistance. This hand, that hand that has issues with either the golfer's elbow or tennis elbow is gonna be doing all the work. From here, this is just gonna block and you're actually gonna try and lift this hand up and it's just gonna stay in the same position. And you're gonna hold for about five, 10 seconds. Really using this muscle, you'll feel it activate. It might be a little bit tender. So only push as hard as you feel comfortable pushing and just make sure that there's no sharp pains. It can be a muscle strain, like you're lifting a heavy bag of groceries, but no more than like a two out of 10. So from there, you would push, hold for that five, 10 seconds, and then you would relax. From here, you're gonna progress through that range you're gonna bring it to the end range now, hands in the same position, push again. Really trying to push that hand into that other hand, working the muscle through here, stretching it out, building some, some tension and some blood and some kind of nutrients coming to that area. And then you'll relax and just stretch into that position. So you can do that both in this direction and down into this direction, and obviously on both hands as well which is really good for obviously bringing some blood to the area, getting some, some endurance and some strength built back up so that holding things like that aren't as irritating. Furthermore, you can always self massage, kind of dig your thumb into that area and then just stretch out the arm underneath it as well, which tends to help. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's a wrap. Dr. James, there was loads of information. Um, thanks to everyone for your time and attention this evening. Um, we look forward to seeing you in the office soon and uh, maybe out on the golf greens. Um, that was a great, uh, great informative session. Thanks, Dr. James. You're welcome. <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> Yes, everyone have a lovely night. There's a bit of rain happening, but uh, it's time for spring. <laughs> Hopefully the weather improves and we can all get out on the golf course. It'll be exactly. better. Take yeah. care, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks a lot.